Okay. Working? Hi, everyone. Is it working? Can you hear me? Okay. So uh, we would like to start on time. Uh, I hate to interrupt you, but if you would like to listen while you are standing there, I have no problem. I don't know if Sean has a problem. Sean? Uh, do you have a problem if we start and they are around there? For me, I don't have. How about you when you do the introduction? You want them to sit down or to stay where they are? He didn't answer me. <laughs> okay. So I will start anyway. And I uh, would like to welcome you all to our Delta Omega Honorary Society speaker series. And if I didn't get to introduce myself to you tonight, I am Dean Iman Hakim, uh, one of the first members of our Delta Omega chapter. I'm actually an alum of the first graduating class, 94, don't count my age. <laughs> and I am honored to have uh, the Mellon Enid Zuckerman <laughs> College of Public Health partner with the Delta Omega to present this speaker series. So I want to welcome uh, some of our Delta Omega Honorary Society board member, Sean, Glenn Daniel, right there. He is an MPH of 2004 and an MBA in 2021. Sean will be the moderator of our panel today. And welcome to John McElligot. Where is John? Here over there. He is an MPH of 2005 and CPH, which is certified in public health, if you don't know the uh, credential. So Sean and John are both doing great work in the public health field. Sean holds academic appointments and is actively involved with various governing and advisory boards and committees, including the Arizona Public Health Association. And John is the executive director of the Maricopa County Medical Society in Phoenix and serves on the National Board of Public Health Examiners. I also want to welcome our two panelists today, both alumni of the college, so please join me in welcoming Anna, Carol uh, Anna Carolina Ortiz. Is it Carolina or Carolina? Carolina. So I did it right. Anna Carolina Ortiz, MPH of 2017, and Zeda Didolfi Picoro from MPH 2017. Please join me in welcoming them. They are both Delta Omega members. Today, Anna and Deda will, will be talking with us about the current state of maternal and child health, both locally and global, on a global scale. I am happy to welcome everyone to this event. It has been too long since we have saw each other in person here in Phoenix. I am delighted to see some of our Phoenix campus and online students in the audience, as well as alumni and community supporters. Well, Dr. Cecilia Rosales was not able to join us today, but I want to recognize her outstanding leadership for our Phoenix campus and our, for our community engagement program. Thank you, Cecilia. She's expecting a new grandbaby. That's why she's not here. I just saw the secret. <laughs> I also welcome our virtual guests who are watching the live stream video of this event. I am so pleased we can all come together today to reunite. So good to see all of you. Our college has been making headlines and we are very proud of what we have been able to accomplish recently. I would like to touch on a few of our accomplishments. First, our mobile health units in Phoenix and Tucson have been working to deliver COVID vaccine to underserved communities in Maricopa County around the state and in our border communities. They have provided more than 64,000 vaccine shots so far. And of course, the mobile health unit teams also provide services for maternal and child health, our topic for today. We are so proud of the mobile health unit team and all what they do for our community. Second, our Global Health Institute has been working very hard to set up partnership with other countries and institutions internationally. We recently hosted students from the Universidad del Valle de Mexico, which is a new partner, 
and hosted a professor from University of Technology at Sydney, Australia, to establish a partnership there around One Health, and all of you know about the pandemic, One Health is now in the horizon. Third, our week-long YES Camp for Youth program, and YES stand for Youth Engagement for Success. It was held in Aguila uh, this summer, a town in rural Maricopa County. The camp connect with our careers in health services to build our workforce. Finally, our Arizona Heroes Research Grant that studies COVID immunity and vaccine effectiveness was awarded a third year of funding from the CDC because it has provided so much important data over the last two years. And it is a $22 million for this year alone. So congratulations to our Arizona Hero, our research team. We are excited to share this accomplishment with you all, and we will continue to pursue our public health and health equity mission. As you know, the Delta Omega Honorary Society connects students, faculty, and alumni as professional network to develop future public health leaders. Today, our topic is the current state of the maternal and child health, both regionally and globally. As you probably know, MESCOF advocates in many ways for maternal and child health. We have several ongoing programs for children's health, and we have raised more than 385000 to support this program, which help for, with help from our community partner as well as alumni. You can see all of these programs on our giving web pages. Our funded programs help kids learn positive health habits that make a long-term impact. For example, our Healthy to Be Me program helps children aged 7 to 10 years old. It's coordinated by the Zuckerman Family Center for Prevention and Health Promotion and bring the passion of public health students so they can teach children about diet, exercise, and wellness. All of these programs are run by our students and our faculty uh, as part of their uh, community service. We also have a program that supports high school students, the Young Global Leaders Program. It enables students to explore public health through hands-on lab experiences, meetings with professional and faculty, and team-based learning. It gives them a perspective on the positive impact of public health locally and globally. Our children programs touch so many lives, and we are so thankful to our donor who helped establish them. Now, talking about children, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers, Anna Carolina Ortiz and Zeda Didolf Picoro. They are both outstanding community advocates and leaders in the field of public health. So Anna, has global experience as the founder of the Arizona Global Development Network, which brings together the state's leading international development and humanitarian non-governmental organization for active collaboration and collective impact. She also serves on the board of director of the International Association for Community Development, where she represents Latin America to promote global community development initiative and she served on the board of director for the Young and Empowered Women Association. And recently, she has started a new role in the mental health director at Aliento. So congratulations on the new role. Uh, so Anzeda uh, has supported the children of Arizona through her role as the director of the health policy at Children's Action Alliance, a nonprofit organization that identify and eliminate barriers to the well-being of children and families through partnership and policy solutions. In this role, Zeda strives to cultivate community-driven solutions that promote health justice and to build Arizona where every child has access to high-quality, affordable health care. We are so pleased to have you both with us today. They will share their experiences and perspectives on the challenges we face now in maternal and child health and family health services. So I will now welcome the president of our chapter of the Delta Omega Honorary Society, Sean Clint Daniel, to the microphone. It's all yours. Okay. 
hot mic, right? Did I get your blood going? How y'all doing? Good. It's Friday evening. We made it. Or for some, it's just another day that ends in Y. <laughs> Thanks, Dina Keem. It's so nice to hear about all the things that are going. So before we get into the best part of the evening about talking about what our um, esteemed panelists are doing and some interaction with the group, just want to give a little bit of what Delta Omega is, what it does, and how we can engage you all, hopefully to become members and to give back to public health. Um, but before we get to that, definitely want to give a couple shout outs. Like everything in life, it's about partnerships, it's about relationships, and it's about the people we do this with and for. And in all those regards, we got to give a shout out to a couple people in the audience here. Um, Amber, thank you for everything you're putting this on. Thank you for your partnership. Shipper, thank you for all the partnership and putting this on as well. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and that's especially for the folks on TV land. Um, but please give yourselves a round of applause as well. You know, in public health, we can be a very self-deprecating group. <laughs> Humility is something we have in spades. And so there's always an opportunity that what you're doing is super important. Society needs it. We all need it more now than ever. So thank you for everything that you're doing. If you're not becoming health professional and public health professional, keep on the path. If you're somebody that circled the sun a couple more, be reinvigorated by the work that we all have to do. Um, the Delta Omega Honorary Society was started in 1924 with the sole purpose to promote the graduate study of public health and to recognize outstanding achievement in this field. The Alpha New chapter is the one that's uh, within the Mellon Enid Zuckerman College of Public Health. Um, and it was started, I guess Dina Kim said, just a few moons ago. I don't remember. It's been around for a while. Um, since that point, we've inducted over 240 members and growing, I think something like 30 states now. We have two of our newest enrollees here this last year. Membership into Delta Omega reflects the dedication, dedication of individual to increasing the, um, the quality of the field, as well as to promote and advance the discipline and the science of public health. Um, one of the most important things we do every single year is induction of new members. That comes through recent graduates, practice health professionals, and honorary. So if you know of anybody that would like to, or you think should be recognized and be inducted, please let us know. We'll definitely hit you up as well. Um, and one of the other things we do is events like this and recognizing the work that is being done by members and by alumni and other things. So without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get into the formal part of the evening tonight where both the panelists we've asked just to give a few minutes kind of what they do, why they do it, maybe a little bit about their pathway of how they got here and really what, you know, what, what impassions them the most. And then we have some questions. I have a few, but the goal is really to make this an interactive for all amongst friends. Let's learn and share together. So we'll hopefully it's it'll become a dialogue. So think of a few questions as well. Sound good? good. All right. Anna, you want to go first? Sure. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm all happy to uh, come back to, to Meskoff and, and help represent. Um, so it's an honor to be here. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit about my journey. Um, I Hello, hello. Okay. Um, I stumbled upon public health uh, while I was working abroad in international development for a couple years. It was so it wasn't until I was out in the field that I learned about it. Um, I'm a little embarrassed to <laughs> admit that, but that's how I happened upon it. And uh, when I returned to the U.S., I was like, I really need to learn more about this public health thing. But I wasn't ready to commit to uh, grad school yet. So I got some experience in public health, uh, working uh, with some international development. And then I decided, you know what, I, there's only so much I can do without a degree. So I decided to, to move to Tucson and get my degree. And, and since then, um, a lot of my experience has focused in international development. I was in the MCH Global Health Track. Um, so I've been lucky enough to work with rural communities all throughout Latin America and also in Mozambique um, in helping them gain sustainable access to uh, community development initiatives like access to clean water, safe housing, food security, you know, some of the basic building blocks of life. Um, but uh, 
as, as Dean Hakim mentioned in my intro, uh, just this week I, I transitioned to a different role. Uh, so it's kind of switching tracks a little bit for me. Um, I'm now working a little bit more locally uh, with an agency called Aliento. Um, they work uh, with the undocumented population here in Maricopa County. Um, and the work focuses on transforming trauma into hope and action. And one of the ways that we do that is through helping the impacted community, you know, process and hopefully let go of the trauma of falling through the gaps of the American system. And we do that through healing activities, the arts. Um, and, you know, I'm very excited to be a part of this, this new uh, endeavor with Aliento. Um, I think that they're a big force here in Phoenix. So if you're not familiar with them, I encourage you to look it up. Um, yeah, that's a little bit about my journey. Hi. Um, thank you also for inviting me. I feel a little um, out of my league in this room right now, but that's okay. Um, I'm Zeta. I'm the Director of Health Policy at Children's Action Alliance. So I think the easiest way to describe what we do is we don't hand out backpacks. We don't um, give shots or anything like that. We really just work in the policy space uh, for children and for families in the state of Arizona who are under-resourced and underrepresented in our state government. Um, so in the health space, that means I do a lot of work with Medicaid and CHIP and FQHCs, um, also directly interacting with families who are participating in those programs or who have not been able to participate in those programs for one reason or another, really looking at identifying barriers to not just health insurance, but health care, um, and looking at people's experiences with those systems to figure out how we can make the entire system better for everybody, right? Um, Trying to think what else I should mention. Yours was so good. Um, and Sean told me I didn't need slides. So I, uh, I'm just going to talk until someone tells me yeah. to stop, if that's OK. Um, yeah, so a lot of our work has really focused on um, promoting access to care, um, taking the programs that we do have available to us as a state, and making sure that we are using them to their full potential. I'm just going to give you a little spoiler alert. We're not. Um, we have so much further that we could be taking these programs. We can be covering more kids. We can be covering more adults. We can be covering more services. We can be providing a holistic healthcare experience, and we're not. Um, and that is, um, I think, something that ripples throughout somebody's entire life, right? We know that when kids don't have access to care, they can't focus in school. Um, we know that when kids don't have access to health care, they earn less as adults, right? We are perpetuating so many big picture cycles when we're not focusing on the health of our kids and, you know, the health of their parents, right? Preconception health, we know more and more, is critically important. So a couple of the things that we worked on this year, um, just for perspective, 12-month postpartum coverage extension. That's really cool, right? Right now, if you give birth and you are otherwise fully eligible for Medicaid, that's a big asterisk right there. Um, you may lose coverage at day 60 after you deliver. I know personally as a mom, that is not enough time, right? That is not enough coverage. You are dealing with all kinds of things, physical, mental, emotional. Your child is dealing with things as well um, that so many of us just can't you know, don't have any experience with, don't know how to handle. Um, and that support is so critical. But for a lot of people right now, about 3,000 people a year, they just get cut off at day 60. You don't have health care. Um, starting as soon as, as soon as the feds say it's okay, <laughs> those, those folks will be able to stay covered for a full year. Um, and that's really great, right? Like I worked on that a lot this year, so I have to take you know, a little bit of pride in it and also recognize that it does not go far enough. Um, so we are not covering as many people as we could be, not as many birthing parents as we should be. Um, there are still too many people in Arizona who don't qualify for Medicaid based on their documentation status, based on their income, and we can stretch those limits, right? We just need to make kids and families a priority. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the things in policy that we, that we think about is, you know, you're trying to make this really big change by taking really small steps. <laughs> and it's infuriating, but I <laughs> freaking love it. So it's, if you love banging your head against the wall, come and talk to me because... <laughs> That is what I do all day. <laughs> so, um, so that's just kind of one example of what we've been looking at um, for perspective. I'm happy to talk about other things as well. And who doesn't like to bang their head against the wall? 
And I see her beautiful son, and I can test as a father as well. It's like parenting, right? So you just bang that head all the time. Um, and you know what I always had to appreciate is that, again, going back to we're a humble group, somebody got a nice promotion this week, doesn't talk about that, talks about why this work's important, and then gives kudos to the company. And then she says, not worthy amongst. When I think of policy in the state, I literally think it's it. She knows it better than anybody. So um, if you want to know what's happening in the world of policy, I learn every single one of our public health association. I'm taking prestigious notes. So it's nice to share. All right, so we're going to go through some questions. And how about we start with um, Anna? Tell us about yourself while we did that. What's some of the work that's really specific to um, maternal and child health? A couple programs or activities or things of what you're doing. Um, so going back to what I was doing in my previous role, um, I think that I didn't focus specifically on maternal and child health, but let's face it, everything affects maternal and child health when we're talking about public health. So just to give you a little bit of a, of a kind of zoom into the work that I was doing, um, I worked closely with grassroots nonprofit organizations, for example, in Nicaragua. Uh, one of the biggest programs there was building water systems for rural communities. These are communities that are basically on their own in terms of, you know, figuring out their water, their electricity, everything like that. The government doesn't really step in to provide those things. Here you buy a house, it's connected to all the systems you need. You don't need to uh, worry about sewage or water or anything like that. Just make sure you sign up with APS and then you're set. Um, there it's not quite that easy. Um, these are communities that have existed there for many, many years, yet they're still cut off from, you know, what we consider like the regular system. So it's really up to communities to organize, to come together, to find leadership within themselves and to present a proposal and come to a nonprofit and say, hey, we need help. And we're willing to put skin in this game if you take a, a chance on us. Um, and the organization that we partner uh, with Nic in Nicaragua, really, you know, that's kind of their... Um, their focus and, and what they're really, really good at is partnering with communities that step up and say, we're willing to do this really hard work um, because it sometimes takes years from inception of communities coming to them to actually, you know, having running water in their home. So it's a, it's a long period for people to stay committed and not give up. Uh, it, it takes a lot from the entire community. So at that point, um, the organization, you know, we send experts out into the field to kind of, uh, assess the situation, you know, what are the true water needs, how can we get water into the community, and then all the wonderful uh, engineers come out and kind of design a, a plan. Um, and to me, you know, this, when we're talking about rural communities in, in developing countries, like, it doesn't get more simple than clean water. Uh, if you don't have clean water, you can't cook clean food. Um, you can't bathe on a regular basis. Um, you know, you can't make formula for your baby. Um, so it really trickles down to every aspect of life. Um, and I think that's one of the, the programs that I kind of leaned more into because I just, I, I saw it as, you know, a big, big building block of life. Um, and I got to spend a lot of time there uh, really getting to know the communities and their needs and... Um, that was just one aspect of it. Another really, really cool aspect of it that, that kind of ties into clean water is irrigation. Um, and you're like, irrigation, that doesn't really sound too exciting. <laughs> I know, um, <laughs> but hang in there with me. Um, <laughs> so these same communities, right, they, they gain access to clean water and you're like, cool, check them off the list, they're done. No, there's still a bunch of other issues that they have to confront. That was just the first one. Um, Next on the list is, okay, how do we get, you know, food security? How do we get access to food on a regular basis from our own land without having to travel hours to the nearest town to, like, shop or whatever? Um, so with this kind of foundation of working with communities, you've already identified community leaders, people that step up on their own and say, I'm willing to do this hard work. You keep working with them, and they, you know, keep leading you to other projects and other work. And uh, one of those things has been um, irrigations for agricultural fields. Um, we worked with uh, other nonprofits, other organizations that bring in solar panels. So then you don't have to worry so much about electricity. And next thing you know, you have a field of greens 
that is not only feeding a family, it's feeding a community, it's employing not just the family, it's employing their neighbors, and you started a cycle. It's a cycle that's really hard to stop once you started it. It's giving people employment, giving people dignity and agency back in their life. And to me, how can you not tie that to maternal and child health? That gives access to a child to go to school, um, to go to the doctor. Um, now the family has a little bit of income that they can actually spend when they need medicine. Um, so it's, it's kind of not directly tied. It's not, you know... Um, like some other topics that are more directly tied to maternal and child health. But for me, that's the foundation. If you don't have that, then you can't really work on the others. All right, Zeta. In a world where we're literally and metaphorically underwater, on fire, facing a rapid evolution of infectious diseases, why is it so important to stay focused on health policy? I, th I think that a lot of people take the policy side of health for granted. Um, and I will say that, let me actually, can we just do like a little experiment maybe? Like, um, Sean, who's your state senator? Oh man, I fail miserably. Um, I'll give you a hint, it's not Kirsten Cinema. Uh, well, yeah, I know that much. Okay, <laughs> Sorry, good, I'm like, good. I know that's, like that's um, a huge one. It used to be um, Kelly, Townsend. Oh, okay. Cool. That's fun. Um, that is, that's fantastic, right? I ask that question to people all the time and like virtually nobody can come up with an answer. And right now it's kind of okay to not know the answer because we're like about to have an election and it's all going to change and we just change districts, right? So it's okay to be like, we'll find out in November. I'm okay with that answer. I'm not okay with Kirsten Cinema. And part of that, part of that is because, um, so much of what happens in federal policy is just the groundwork. And it's up to the state to enforce it and to build upon it and to make sure that it is getting implemented in ways that are going to benefit our communities. Um, and I think it's really easy to get stuck at the federal level and to forget that that's just the basement, right? Like we got to build everything up from there. Um, when we're talking about things like the Inflation Reduction Act, when we're talking about the American Rescue Plan Act, all of these amazing investments in infrastructure and water and technology and clean energy, right? Those are fantastic. You know who decides where that money goes? The people who we elect at the state level and the people that they appoint. So when we're talking about those, those are only as good as the people that we've got in office at the state level. Um, another really big thing that I like to just share, and I think this kind of blows people's minds, I hope you all know this, but the Affordable Care Act, that's cool, right? That's like a really important piece of legislation. Who enforces that in the state of Arizona? Anyone? Nope. Nope. The Department of Insurance and Financial Institutions, which is literally the overseer for every type of insurance in the state. Renters, homeowners, auto, like literally any kind of insurance, health insurance, as well as every type of financial institution. So we're talking banks, we're talking lending, we're talking car loans, we're talking title loans, we're talking like literally everything. They smushed these two organizations together a couple years ago in part because neither of them had the funding that they needed to fully do their jobs. So they made them one big organization that still doesn't have the funding that they need to do their jobs. Um, and this is not just me speculating about this, right? We have an auditor general at the state level that goes through and reviews these organizations and looks at them and says, hey, y'all, like, <laughs> this is not okay. You are investigating, no joke, 10% of the complaints that are coming in about all of the banks all of the lenders and all of the insurance companies in the state, right? So of the thousands of complaints that get filed, that's if you know where to go to file that complaint in the first place, 10% are actually getting fully investigated. And I don't know what y'all do, but like if you ever need a little light reading, like you can go to the OAG website and like read these reports. They're really cool. I also like, I have a sick habit of reading, um, reading daycare inspections. That's like my, that's my guilty pleasure right there is like seeing which daycares are like not cleaning up the lice. 
Yeah, it's real fun. Um, so anyway, so that, that is kind of a picture, right? That's our, our responsibility as a state is enforcement and it's regulation. And we live in a state that really does not like regulation. We are working as hard as we can as a state every single day to strip away regulation and to take away those precautions that are protecting people's health and safety. Um, we're working every day to streamline government, right? So if you hear small government, shrinking government, all of that kind of equates to stripping away regulations, right? And so often this gets phrased as, oh, this is about blow dry bars and like making sure that you can go get a blowout like literally anywhere and like that person can get a job, right? That's what we hear publicly spoken. And it's really easy to say like, yeah, okay, cool. Like I don't, I don't really care who blow dries my hair, you know? Um, this is a real example, again, <laughs> like, I'm, not, I'm not making this up. Um, but what we need to be asking is what's happening to our ability to actually implement these federal protections and these federal rights and responsibilities that we have. So that's my, I don't even know what question you just asked me, but that's my answer. <laughs> how do we stay focused on health policy? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's how. State politics. <laughs> and local. <laughs> I think it was Tip O'Neill that said all politics is local. Probably coined by many people before that, but you're right. All right, so a question to both of you, and I think this is definitely a sign of the times and something that is, if you have children, work with children, or are involved with the children's lives, it's really around these issues around mental health. So the pandemic has been stressful for all of us, um, and many families probably more acute. How do you see the pandemic impact um, MCH, mental health, and what are some practical steps that people in this room and organizations can take to support mothers and children? Sure. Um, I think that it's going to take years still for us to fully understand the complete ramifications of the pandemic on our mental health, especially, I think, for children. I think of all the little kiddos that were like starting kindergarten in 2020 and were forced to do so virtually. Um, I think that there's a lot to be learned in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, I think that public health is gonna have to be very, very proactive in figuring out and innovating day by day. How do we support them as they come to terms with you know, this, this reality that they faced? Um, I think that especially for those little kiddos, um, you know, they still didn't even know how to name their emotions or their, uh, the crisis that they saw their family going through or their isolation or, you know, all these things that they, uh, that they were experiencing. So I think it's, it's going to possibly uh, take a couple years to see that. Um, I think that a couple of the things that we saw during the pandemic were, you know, very flexible uh, policies and workplace adaptations and things like that. And I think that it's critical that we continue some of those. A lot of people talk about it like, oh, we're out of the pandemic. It's after the pandemic. Now it's over. But a lot of those ramifications are going to be with us for many, many years. And I think snapping back into pre-pandemic times is not the healthy thing to do for any of us. Um, but especially for those kids, I think that it's going to take a lot of um, support um, and, and it has to come from different angles. It can't just be in the schools. I think we already put a lot of uh, stress <laughs> on our schools as it is, especially here in Arizona. They're already underfunded. We can't just run everything through the schools, even though it can be convenient because they're already a captive audience there. But we have to think critically about how else can we um, support the kids outside of that and, and, and kind of keep adapting those policies as we go and practices as we go. Um, I don't think that there's a silver bullet response or, or solution for this. I think it's going to, you know, be different for every population. Now that I'm working uh, more so with um, undocumented families and families of mixed status, you know, we're, we're starting to see a lot of it there too. And they have additional barriers um, on top of, you know, the stress and the, the trauma from the pandemic. Um, and we're still learning how to help them process that. I mean, even as adults, I don't know about you guys, but I'm still processing it. I know that my body is still like, 
there's things that are coming up. And I'm like, how is this a thing? And it's like, oh, yeah, two years of crisis and living, you know, with <laughs> feeling like you're on the edge of the world every day. Um, so I think that, you know, we have to give each other a little grace um, and not just at the workplace, but in school, at home, with your loved ones, with people you don't know even. Um, it comes down to those the kindness of every day, and hopefully we can keep spreading that and, and, and adapting that in our public health practices as well. I can only speak from my perspective as a, as a parent who had a lot of privileges during this pandemic, right? I was able to work from home. I was able to, you know, have support for my child. He is a wild animal, and all of the children his age are, like, it is nuts. The pandemic hit when my son was like just over a year old. He has never been to a restaurant. He has never been to a grocery store in his memory, right? So every time we're having those experiences, it's brand new and it is terrifying to them because they haven't had that practice, right, that you get when you're just out and about. I think that, you know, to, to your point and to, to the work that you do, the social emotional learning part of this is so overlooked. And it's something that I think in the, in the pursuit of high test scores and in the pursuit of, I don't even know what they, what they call the weird math now, common core or whatever, like we really sweep social emotional learning under the rug and we can't do that because these kids are not going to know how to cope. Right. Um, again, you know, I was fortunate. I was able to stay home with my son and to be able to enforce some of that, you know, in between zoom calls. Um, but I know that other kids didn't have that, right? We've patched together caretakers. They've had people in and out. They've had um, probably periods of being alone longer than than you might want a child to. Um, and, and that is going to show up later on. Um, I want to just add to what Anna was saying about, you know, making sure that we're looking really long-term at this. I think we have to be thinking about education now, um, it's something that we talk about a lot, but I don't know that we talk about enough within the, the realm of public health. Um, but we have made all of these fantastic investments in school-based health services, right? We are um, getting counselors into schools. We're getting them where they need to be. Um, and those are really fantastic steps that the, the state has taken. I don't want to discredit that in any way. We still have a crisis of provider representation. So we don't have enough black, indigenous, Latino providers in our state to really meet the needs and understand, um, understand the populations that they're working with in their unique situations. And that is not something that you get by just, just investing in higher ed, right? You have to build that from the ground up. You have to build it through math and science in high school and elementary school. You have to build it through getting people into college that they can afford, right? Um, and so this is a really long-term need that we have, but it is a need in every community in this state. Um, another thing that I'll just mention, you know, we do a lot of community outreach work. And one of the things that I hear so frequently from parents is the system works when you're in crisis, but getting help and getting care before that point, before it turns to an absolute emergency can be very impossible because we have this provider shortage. So I think we need to, you know, yes, we want to see crisis services available in every corner of the state. And we wanna make sure that it doesn't have to get to that point and that we're getting kids and families the, the help and the care that they need when it becomes an issue. Um, we hear from people all the time who are like, I recognize that my child is struggling. I recognize that my child is falling behind developmentally. I recognize that my child is struggling with depression right now. And I can't get them in with a therapist for three months. I can't get them in with a therapist who takes my insurance. I can't get them in. Um, I work with one mom who's amazing. She's just, she's just like such a staunch advocate for herself and her family and has been through just like hell and back trying to find a therapist for her daughter. She lives in Maricopa County. <laughs> she should have access to healthcare. Everyone should have access to healthcare where they live, right? Um, but for her, it was a matter of having to call the police on her own daughter in order to get her in for crisis care. That should not be how we're doing healthcare, like period. That's not, that's not how this should be working, but that is how it's working right now. Let you add. 
I just echo everything you say. I mean, I I kind of have a similar situation as well. You know, I am privileged. I have a job. I you know I have a stepson and similar situation where it took us. There's four parents involved, <laughs> and even with the four parents and the two counselors and the vice pr principal and everyone, it took us months to find access to to a psychologist that could see him on a regular basis. And I'm like. If I am having that much trouble and I live in an urban area and we have, you know, health insurance, various health insurances to pick from, then how are other families doing it? Then, and the thing is, they're not. It, they're not. And it's just, and, and to me, this is why I've, I've preached this for a long time. This is why public health there's need to be in every sector possible, because we bring that lens that is often missing of, you know, health isn't everything, health and all policies, right? Um, <laughs> I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I truly believe that. And, and you know, you speak about education. If we had more public health people in education, we could bring that lens and hopefully make it a little bit more comprehensive and, and you know, help solve some of these things from the bottom up instead of waiting until they're crisis mode. Can I just add to that as well? The school-based health services, that's fantastic, right? We're bringing services to where people need them. But can you imagine being in the seventh or eighth grade and going to therapy and then being expected to go to math class? That sounds like it would, like, that's bananas, right? Like, we're expecting them to, like, process their trauma and then just go back to school. Like, it's no big deal, right? Like, we need to be thinking outside of the box there, the school box. So we touched, you touched base on a couple of things. So just slight deviation, but something that certainly everybody in this room and that public health has been on the forefront on this forever, even before we call this social determinants of health or whatever we want to call it, flavor of the moment, really around, you know, health equity um, and making sure that everybody is represented, everybody has a seat at the table. So based on your experience, how can organizations improve diversity and equity in specifically maternal and child health? And you have 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, gosh. I, I think part of it starts with building relationships, and that feels like such a corny answer, but really just asking people, like not asking the providers who they're working with, ask the actual individual who is trying to seek those services what they need, right? Um, this is something that as an organization we've been working on, trying to really get not to the CEO level at an organization, not to the caseworker level or the the physician level, but really getting to the patient level and trying to understand where the barriers are that they're facing, because that's what that's what we can do in policy is knock those down, right? Um, but we have to know they're there. Um, so promoting opportunities for people to engage in policy, a lot of a lot of the work that I do winds up being kind of interpretation, right? Like I am telling people how this policy is going to impact you directly. Um, when they might not have any idea what, you know, what, what is going on at the legislature, who their legislator is, it doesn't matter, right? They should still have a right to know what, what this is going to do for them and, and how they can become involved, right? So like promoting kind of growing advocates um, from folks who are experiencing these barriers in every single place that they try and access right now. Um, the other part of that is compensating them for their time, right? Like build it into your grants, pay people for their time because we can't expect people to come and share their trauma and share their thoughts and share their experiences if you're just doing it for free and then you send them home and it's just right back into it. So um, we like to do gift cards often um, for food, for gas, for, you know, whatever it might be. Um, we usually ask, like, how do you want to get paid? We value your time. Tell us, like, what do you prefer? Um, and then also, you know, from the policy perspective, we tend to not think about the direct service as much, but making sure that you're closing that loop is really important. So knowing all of those people that you might need to refer them to in the event that they do have a need that you can't meet. Um, I think is really important. I second all of that. Um, I, and as, as you were talking, I had a couple examples come to mind. Um, at Aliento, uh, we work with a lot of youth. It really is a youth-led, youth-focused organization. 
Um, and that's a lot of uh, high school interns, uh, college interns, and then we offer some fellowships as well. And all the fellowships are paid. And why is that? Because these are uh, youth from impacted communities, from impacted families. That means that they're documented, undocumented. Um, and if they're going to be giving back to an organization and doing hard work, then they deserve to be compensated because that, you know, if it was an uncompensated position, they might not be able to do that because they might have to go get a part-time job somewhere else to help their family. And here they don't have to make that compromise. So I totally agree. Making sure that these things are, are compensated for, you know, the, the communities that you're trying to gain information from is critical. Um, and again, I, I also agree with asking the people that you're working with. Um, I, I have an, another example. It's going to seem like kind of a tangent, but I swear it applies. Um, in my previous role, you know, we were kind of making this big stink about like the way that we approach the work that we do working in, um, in rural communities, in developing countries. Are we coming across as white saviors? How can we avoid coming across as white saviors? How can we improve our work so we're not, you know, perpetuating that work? And we were like banging our heads against the wall, basically just trying to answer these questions by ourselves. And I was like, you know what? We should really ask our partners to see what they think. And they were like, what do you mean? No, you don't come across as white saviors. We're partners. This is a horizontal relationship. We both give and take. And it just, it blew my mind because I, <laughs> I never thought that it would be that simple or that we were just making up issues in our own head. So if you would just ask the people that you're working with or working for, what do you need? How do you need it? How do you prefer it? How often? Um, bringing us into the conversation is a, it's a power change. You're part of the conversation. You're not the topic of the conversation. That's a big difference. And I think it can be very powerful. And that's when you can start seeing people react and recognize that they have a seat at the table even though they didn't even know there was a table available. All right, looking at everybody out there, you've probably been thinking, processing. Now is your chance to think of some questions. Do we have any volunteers? If not, I have more, but there you go. All right. So, uh, thank you, Sean. So, hi, uh, John. Um, I think a lot of people made mistakes over the last several years. So a big thing that's gotten a lot of news recently, you talked about education, and there's a big decision that a lot of local and state health departments had to make. What about, um, do we try to keep kids out of school to protect them and their families and keep them alive or put them back in school, right? So getting to the mental health, you talked about that before. Um, my question is not about whether that was right or wrong. Yeah, so I don't know if there's an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> but the question is, um, there's a lot that we've learned about that process and whether communities or individuals trust public health at all. Um, and communities of color, communities, underserved communities, rightly so, bad history of public health, misusing those communities. So what do you think um, the communities that you're serving locally and policy-wise, uh, do you feel like anyone has learned from that? And what do you think will come out of it? I think that that was a big question and probably everyone could like feel Anna and I sighing <laughs> when that came up. Sorry about that. Um, but I think that one of the things that we can do to begin to address that is admit what we don't know. Um, and so, you know, I think early in the pandemic, we all had these thoughts about what was going on and how this disease was spreading and like what the situation was and what we needed to do to protect ourselves. Um, and at that time I was like, close the schools, close the schools. Like right now we need to like keep people alive. We don't know how this is going to impact kids. Let's be real. We still don't know how this is going to impact kids, right? We don't, we have two years of data about this disease and its impact and, I don't know. Leslie, you probably know way more. <laughs> I'm like, you can tell us more about what this is going to do. But, um, but I think that we all had to make 
the best choices that we could with the best information that we had. And the information that we had was not all that great. So as it's evolving, the situation is going to change and we're going to have a new perspective on it and be able to make the right choices. That might be different for my family than for your family. It might be different um, all around. Um, one of the things that I think was really interesting about the school closures is how rapidly the rate of um, child welfare complaints decreased. Um, and I think kind of looking at the child welfare system from an abolitionist lens, it's we need to recognize that the vast majority of those complaints are not about abuse, they're about neglect. And so in many ways, that is a complaint about a household being poor. That's a complaint about a household maybe not having water on this week. It's not necessarily a sign that that child is being harmed. It's a sign that that family needs help. And we need to be figuring out how we can better allocate resources to families to make sure that we're not taking children out of their families because they're poor, right? How do we get the resources to the families? Um, and so I think you can look at that in one of two ways. You can be like, oh my gosh, like all these kids who are being harmed or not getting care. You can also look at it as all of these kids who needed help weren't getting help. Um, and all of these kids who needed help um, maybe were able to be with their families or weren't being taken away from their families when they might have been, right? So there's all of these different perspectives that you can look at. I don't know that anyone can make that choice, but I do think we need to look at how we're like allocating resources and how we're investing in prevention um, before we can begin to answer that. Huge question. Um, and I don't think there's a single solution, a single answer. The one that I gravitate towards, which is which was one of my biggest lessons learned as a public health advocate, practitioner, is we need to get better at communicating with the public. We need to put the public back in public health. Um, you know, I was, and, and, and I understand there was a lot that we didn't know and we were doing the best we could with the information we had at the moment. But now that we know what we know, how can we improve for the next pandemic, for the next endemic, for the next whatever's coming? Um, because I think that there were a lot of critical errors made at critical times, just in the way that we were, communicating with the public about what was going on, either by not being clear enough or not, um, you know, the different timelines and things like that. And I think even to this day, <laughs> I've looked at the CDC website many times, making travel arrangements for volunteers, trying to figure out, okay, when do I have to test? And, and when do I, when I come back? And I'm in public health. And it's still for me, it feels like doing math backwards. And it's really complicated. I'm like, there has to be a better way to do this. So if anyone's looking for a concentration or something to, to uh, focus on in public health, communications is a huge and is going to continue to be a huge aspect of the work that we do. How do we tell people how to best take care of themselves? And this, and this goes across the spectrum, right? Like we, we need to keep in mind the different populations that we're talking to, uh, urban versus rural. Uh, pockets, minorities, you know, um, the, the urban poor, the rural, rural poor, all these things need to be taken into consideration. And I feel like that is not necessarily, um, what's the word? Um, that should be like its own track <laughs> in public health uh, because it's such a huge part of what we do, but I don't think that enough of us do it well enough to, you know, make better decisions in the future, unfortunately. Well said, yeah. I always think that like, if you deconstructed everything that went into the pandemic and afterwards, these things were all there. It was just a massive referendum on the system and the stress less test that we've never experienced. And we've all lived this reality. I can test children that were buoyant one day, were melancholy the next, and who knows what that trauma will look like in the long run. I hope that it's resiliency and we'll learn from it, but um, yeah, glad it's over, but it really isn't over. Or and then I can test the algorithm of like, how can I get on the plane and when should I go? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I know there's a couple other hands for questions. Oh. Yeah. Um, just because it's really interesting. That was a great question. Um, I think for me, when all of this is going on with the pandemic and two, of course, I think it was like a big 
wake up call and was like, oh, a lot of these people don't trust public health, you know, and like me being in public health, I have bachelor's and master's in it. So it's like, obviously I love it. Um, but I was like, wow. Or even my sister, they'd call me like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't trust the vaccine. There's just not enough data. Like, and part of me was like, how can you say that? Like, you didn't even, you know, like you don't have a study in it and, and at all. But like a lot of people were saying things like this and it was really interesting to me to see that. So then I was thinking like, wow, like, I know there's a lot of history where like we haven't done a great job, you know, especially with research and a lot of things like that. So I totally understand. But for the most part, I thought like, oh yeah, people trust public health professionals, you know, like we do our stuff, we, we do good in school, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just kind of wanted to say that where I thought for me was really, um, yeah, like a wake up call and how do we change that for the future, like learning from our mistakes from the pandemic moving forward. Is it okay if I move on to a different question? Yeah, totally cool. cool. Um, so this is just straying a little bit away from the kind of COVID conversation, but still uh, maternal child health. And I'm um, going to start with the question and maybe get a little bit like background on it. But how do you work to help, um, I guess, with either programs, policies, um, and the best of your knowledge, uh, to help uh, families who are experiencing shame or guilt and the, for the situation that they're in so that they're not able to get the resources that they need? Um, because they're not necessarily coming forward. Um, so that's kind of the question, but um, we tend to see that parents, they definitely always, there's that feeling of like, am I a good enough parent? Um, how, am I supporting my child enough? And then when something does happen to their child and they feel like they, they feel all that responsibility, even if it's because of lack of resources, um, where they live, their job, what whatever that may entail. Um, and then there's all this pressure from society as saying like how you should be a parent and what you should be doing for your child. How do you um, reach families that may not be um, looking for these resources because they're scared they're gonna have that, because they already have that shame and that guilt um, for the situation that, the, that they're in? Kind of in my wheelhouse, yeah. <laughs> um, I was just nodding the entire time you're speaking. Um, yeah, it's very real. It's very um, difficult. Um, I think the first thing uh, that you have to do is provide a safe space, first of all. Uh, you have to build community. You have to, you know, provide that, that space where people feel, first of all, comfortable showing up, period, um, you know, a lot of the, the families that we work with, super hardworking. Some of them work two, three jobs. So first of all, having a space for them to come at a time they can come and in a place they can access um, is step one or even pre-step, right? <laughs> Before you even start. Um, and, and building a space that's psychologically safe, where they feel like they can be vulnerable and share some of their... Um, you know, their shame, their guilt. Those those are feelings that you're not proud of. Those are things that are hard to admit for anyone. Um, so I think, first of all, you have to provide that, sa that space where people feel comfortable speaking up because they know that you have their back that and that you're not going to judge them based on what they, they've done or haven't done. Um, and that can be really, really challenging, really, really difficult. It's not easy work, uh, but it's doable. Um, and at that point, I think it's just a matter of really listening <laughs> to, to that family and not trying to, um, put a, a round peg in a square hole or however that goes. Um, you know, each family has their own unique needs. Um, so by saying, like, oh, follow this brochure and go do this and have your kids help you like that, that's not going to work. Sometimes they, they need to be walked through each step, like, okay, call Susie at this office, and then she's going to put you in touch with these services or, you know, whatever that takes. Um, so I think it's really walking with the families through the process sometimes, because just because you talk to them one time or even a couple of times, that doesn't mean that those feelings of shame and guilt are going to go away. Um, if anything, once they start accessing services, they might come back and be reinforced depending on the provider. So it's really being that advocate for communities um, and for families and, and walking with them through that process, which is a lot of work. It's, it's, it's really uh, hard on, on providers and, and, you know, people in the community doing that. So I think it's also 
Yeah, we have to take care of ourselves. <laughs> kind of to, to Sean's point, you know, we're, um, we're a good group of people and we're just trying to, to do good in the community. So we have to take care of ourselves as well um, to make sure that we can be there for the long run and keep doing good for our communities. No, that was, that was a wonderful tangent. Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to add something to that that I think came to mind when you were talking and, and also, um, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Annette, um, to Annette's question, part of it is about culture and power. Um, I mean, everything is about culture and power, let's be real. But specifically when it comes to this, the way that we reimburse for public health, the way that we reimburse for physician's visits is about you get 15 minutes and that's what you're going to get paid for, right? That doesn't leave a lot of time to help a new mom understand how much her baby should be eating in a day or like, you know, these questions that are really fundamental that, um, that we, we aren't looking at as valuable. So I think we need to redefine that value and we need to change the way that we're making grants so that it can allow for that deeper connection and conversation. And we also need to be reimbursing the folks who are on that front line because that is trauma in itself, right? Like that is vicarious trauma that you are going to experience every day when you are talking to families who are hitting those walls, like just repeatedly hitting walls. Like it gets to you. I know I've been there. Like it, I'm sure many people in this room have been there. Like it's not easy. And telling people like to go get a manicure and like do self care is like not really helpful <laughs> in that situation. Like you need a little bit more, like, how am I going to pay for that manicure? I get paid $12 an hour, you know? Um, so like, yeah. And, and I think that that's a, a very real reality. Part of it is also recognizing like your own perspective and your own cultural views of things like poverty. So I remember like a couple, this was probably a couple years ago, I had this like fan, fantastic conversation with it. Uh, a young woman who um, she grew up rural Navajo Nation um, without electricity or water, and and she said one of the first things that she always does in conversation is, you know, level set. When you say poverty, what are you talking about? Because I grew up in a home with no water and no power, but we weren't poor. Like, we had everything we needed. Um, and government, or are we talking about a failure to be able to access the things that you need, that you have identified for yourself and your own family and your values? Any other questions? If not, what I propose is to scrunch the screen there. There's some uh, light bulbs raised in the back. I hope to give it time if you kind of want to ease down. Please stay. I'll finish closing remarks and we'll continue the conversation together. Does that sound like a plan? I just feel like I'm kind of a tour guide. This is a six hour tour. But it's a Friday evening. I want to make sure it's having a good time. All right. Well, thank you to um, um, Anna and Zeta. Thanks for sharing all your wisdom and challenges days today, um, Journal of Child Health and Family Level Services. Thank you for, to Dean McKean and to the whole College of Public Health for your partnership on this event and more to come. Uh, Delta Omega, thanks you uh, 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 tremendously for this partnership. Uh, it's been really great to see everybody in this room. It's been great to see, but not see everybody virtually. You can see us, which we can see you can hear us. Um, the next thing is coming up is the homecoming facilities, so we hope to see you all there. The college's homecoming awards celebration will be Thursday, October 27th. Mark your calendars, Thursday, October 27th, in Tucson, Iowa Pueblo. It will be held in the Sands Club Skybox at Arizona Stadium. Um, and it does say amazing views of downtown. It truly does. It's really great up there. Um, and uh, so the Award ceremony at State Celebration for 2022 alumni and leaders will be there. And this year we'll be handing out the Delta Omega Honorary Society Alumni Award. So I hope to see you there. Um, and I, if I'm recalling correctly, I think the Wildcats play USC that day. I'd like to say that it's UNC Spoiled Children or UNC Second Choice. I grew up in LA and I was at UCLA fan. So nonetheless, we will go for the Wildcats. Um, 
Sorry, I get a microphone and I just. <laughs> my is always like, shut up, Sean. Actually, my kids say that more now. <laughs> I'll just end there. Um, thank you for everybody for coming. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Grab some food. Have some good company. And uh, we'll, be, uh, kind of, we'll be in contact with y'all. Thanks. Thank you.